some clients will come in and say, oh, you know, I don't want to take pills. You know, I just want to change my food and, you know, change everything. And it's really, you know, becomes a bit of an interesting conversation because, um, you know, how do you change through food a lifetime of dysfunction and deficiency, you know, if they're being vegan or vegetarian for, you know, a huge part of their life and they come in extremely deficient in say, you know, iron, zinc and B12. And it's like, well, just starting to eat meat now and even, you know, trying to digest it, that's not going to make up for 30 years of suboptimal nutrition. Hello and welcome to the Mineral Minded Podcast. Are you interested in learning more about vitamins, minerals, heavy metal detoxification and natural health? We explore a range of topics that are related to mineral balancing science and hair tissue mineral analysis, including in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about the wonderful world of natural medicine. I'm your host, John Bumpus. Today on the Mineral Minded Podcast, we had a fantastic conversation with Maria Allerton, formerly known as Maria Schaufflander. She is a clinical nutritionist and functional medicine practitioner from Sydney, Australia, and runs a busy clinic in Dover Heights. She is the founder of the website truefoodsnutrition.com.au. Maria holds an advanced diploma of nutritional medicine and is a registered member of the ATMS, the Australian Traditional Medicine Society. In her practice, she focuses on addressing the underlying causes of ill health, rather than a symptomatic approach to help her clients overcome long-standing health conditions through lifestyle changes, such as healthy eating, addressing vitamin and mineral deficiencies, and eliminating all sorts of bugs, such as parasites and an imbalanced microflora. She is well-versed in reducing toxicity and addressing genetics to enable the body to heal. Hi, Maria. How are you today? I'm great. Thanks, John. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Um, I've been doing a lot of different research on um, more so calcium because I'm working on doing a, a presentation for the HDMA Summit. So a lot of people have misunderstood a little bit of some of the high calcium on a hair test. That's what I've been spending a lot of my time on. But overall, really good. I just you, you might know what it's like when you just immerse yourself in something and then uh, <laughs> it seems like time just flies by, right? So Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm curious, Maria, how did you get into hair tissue mineral analysis? Um, well, it actually started with my son, who was four years old at the time, who was having uh, quite a lot of issues with um, insomnia and um, behavioural stuff, and he just was all over the place. And um, we were trying to address his health through a, a number of avenues, and I was seeing a functional chiropractor at the time. Yeah. And he recommended we do a hair analysis. And at the time, you know, I didn't know anything about the test. Yeah. And um, it showed up that he was uh, very stressed. You know, his pattern was very stressy. And uh, he had a lot of heavy metals and um, basically was in a complete sort of fight or flight situation all the time. So no wonder he wasn't sleeping. And, uh, you know, once I addressed that with just a few key nutrients, um, he was doing so much better, you know, like it was like a completely different child. Yeah. So I thought, oh, this is really interesting. And, you know, then I finished my nutritional course probably two years after that. And, um, yeah, I started using the test right away and I still do with pretty much every client. So I've done, you know, thousands and thousands of them yeah. and um, find them, yeah, extremely valuable. So you kind of came in a little ahead of the curve for most nutritionists, right? When they start doing nutrition, usually they get a hair test and they are only interested in heavy metals. But yeah. so I guess that maybe that was a big thing for you as well. You, you probably looked at the heavy metals first and then considered everything else after. Exactly. Yes, exactly. And I think, um, you know, the simple thing that people look for is always, you know, what's really high and what's really low. Um, without actually looking at the more subtle 
um, patterns. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's another thing that really started standing out for me in the tests is, you know, those ratios and relationships between the minerals and not just the things that were super high or super deficient. <laughs> so, <laughs> so did you, yeah. so I'm curious if you did, so you did a couple key nutrients you said or supplements was it just yeah, vitamins and minerals yeah, we, or were you we did supplementation yeah he was on magnesium and zinc um okay that the biggest ones and um yeah made a tremendous difference um to everything you know to his nervous system primarily um and then later on i added some detox um uh you know binders and things like that as well which really helped with the heavy metal movement and you know once you start investigating someone's methylation status and genetics and all that comes into it as well so then you um finesse all those protocols but yeah i do yeah yeah, lots of that stuff i use with children and adults and um it's very successful Mm, okay that's fantastic (laughs) i love i love having conversations with people that are starting to integrate vitamins and minerals into their approaches nutritionists are obviously my favorite because that's kind of their realm but you know like most naturopaths they go down this realm of herbs first or something and food and and to be honest i don't know about your opinion but i find that more often than not if it was just food related, you could do it by food, but oftentimes you need extra supplementation to really do something about it. A hundred percent. Yeah. I think it's absolutely essential. And, you know, some clients will come in and say, oh, you know, I don't want to take pills. You know, I just want to change my food and, you know, change everything. And it's really, you know, becomes a bit of an interesting conversation because, um, you know, how do you change through food a lifetime of dysfunction and deficiency, you know, if they're being vegan or vegetarian for, you know, a huge part of their life and they come in extremely deficient in, say, you know, iron, zinc and B12 and it's like, well, just starting to eat meat now and even you know trying to digest it that's not going to make up for 30 years of suboptimal nutrition (laughs) that's a good point really yeah like it's you know it's just not realistic like how long have you had this dysfunction for um and also you know absorption is something that people underestimate because you can be taking things um in with diet but if you've got suboptimal hydrochloric acid level or um, enzyme levels and your gut is in a bit of a mess, then how much of that are you actually absorbing based on what your body needs? And the other factor is, you know, everyone is extremely bio-individual in their chemistry. So some people will need much greater quantities of things like zinc and B12, for example, than others. So Yeah, it's quite complicated, but I find a lot of the time when people want to make a quick, you know, a reasonably quick and significant difference to their health, they have to be taking some supplementation. Yeah, I agree. And I found the same, and I've tried the whole food, and I know food first is the the mantra of the nutritional consultant or nutritionist, right? Food is the number one thing. Um, Mm. But let's be honest, food isn't what it used to be, and we're lucky to get the most nutrients in our food. Um, so I see it as nutritional insurance. It's ensuring you're getting enough, um, especially in like those vegetarian, vegan, um, I guess you would say subsects because they are depending on plants, which only really need um, a handful of nutrients to grow. It's not like a, a cow or you know a lamb or something that needs all of the nu- nutrients to function optimally like a human, right? So they're getting a lot less nutrition. Do you find that a lot of those vegetarians and vegans have um, imbalances of any kind in particular? Like you mentioned zinc and B12. I guess there would be other issues that would come up. Yeah, absolutely. I think usually they would have issues with iron, definitely. That's a really common one. So I'd say, yeah, iron, um, zinc, B12. Uh, Look, even magnesium and calcium I find they're really deficient in, especially the vegans, Um, even though, you know, they are meant to be eating quite a high variety of plants they're still not absorbing those nutrients really well. Mm. So I find, yeah, they're actually quite deficient across the board and particularly those genetically prone to mental health issues or, you know, they have some genetics in their family tree that are unfavourable for mental health. I find those people do the worst on vegan and vegetarian diets because they just need so much more protein to make all their 
neurotransmitters and their happy chemicals yeah. in the brain. <laughs> Yeah, and if they have poor digestion, and I don't know about your clients, Maria, but when I work with a lot of vegetarians and vegans, I find they have very low sodium and potassium levels. Yeah. Generally, not always, let's be honest, but usually they do. And I see that as low hydrochloric acid, like you've alluded to earlier. Um, so if they don't have the, the ability to digest things, that might, at least to me, give a reason why they think they feel better on a vegetarian diet because they yeah. can't digest the, the animal protein. So they, of course they feel better because they don't have rotting flesh in their, <laughs> in their digestive system, right? Everyone would, um, yeah. but you know, they think that this is an improvement in their health because they don't have these issues rather than looking at the root of it, which was poor digestion. And then of course, um, you know, if you do have a vegetarian vegan diet, of course, you're going to have micronutrient deficiencies and even excesses like copper. So do you find that there's like a high correlation between, um, I guess, because vegetarians aren't getting enough protein, so they won't be able to get the amino acids to make neurotransmitters. Do you find there's a high co uh, correlation with vegetarians struggling with things like anxiety, depression, and those kind of things? hundred percent. Yeah. And that's in fact, the number one picture that they will present with in clinic. Um, it's usually, I mean, this is, you know, stereotyping and generalizing, but of course, it's yeah. usually, you know, a young female, you know, either a teenager or early twenties, um, you know, mid twenties female who, you know, feels very passionate about animals and, you know, saving the planet and all those really noble things. And, um, you know, they will come in, usually it's depression, anxiety and shocking periods, um, okay. which you know, of course, is all related to copper zinc balance. So they will come in with excessive copper levels because the vegetarian diets are very high in copper. So, you know, all the legumes and grains and nuts and seeds are very copper dominant and zinc deficient. And, uh, you know, zinc we need to get really from animal sources. And they will, yeah, 99% of the time that will be the dominant imbalance. And when they start addressing those two minerals that you know everything changes their mental health and their hormonal health <laughs> so would you say that copper is the bigger one as far as the vegetarian vegan area like like that diet or is there some something else that you might think uh yeah definitely that's a really common imbalance i mean you know people who eat meat also have that imbalance so it's not yeah. you know vegans and vegetarians but um yes that that's definitely a key picture combined with you know low or non-existent b12 low or non-existent iron so you know together those things um don't make for a very nice mental health presentation but also you know we have to remember that when someone's copper dominant their iron is going to be blocked by the copper exactly. as well so it's like a double whammy, you know, they're not eating enough foods rich in iron and they have a copper dominance which blocks their iron from being utilised. So, you know, and iron is a huge cofactor in producing dopamine and serotonin, which is our really, um, you know, feel-good motivational neurotransmitters. So no wonder, you know, they have anxiety and depression because they're actually, they're not eating enough protein to make those nutrients but also they're not um utilizing the cofactors so the iron and the zinc are really really important to produce those neurotransmitters um so yeah it's kind of there's a few holes in every possible way that <laughs> we look at that yeah it's not easy at all but I, i'm just genuinely curious that's why i asked um mm. so what what we usually find is there's usually what two indications as far as i'm aware of which is a very high copper what they might have or you might find the same picture of you know the young girl or the vegan or vegetarian they can be men i know this because i when i was 20 i had the same things that you've talked about and i went down the same path um so we, we can also find a very low copper level Mm. So do you think that low copper level is also indication of a po possible copper problem? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I find that's definitely a lot um, less common than the high presentation. But, yeah, if someone is coming in with low copper, so, for example, on the hair, if they're a fast metabolizer, yeah. they tend to be a little bit more stressy, um, you know, in their makeup and, that, yeah, they're very fast their copper levels will tend to be lower, um, which is also a problem because copper is required to convert the dopamine to noradrenaline 
in our brain and to regulate that fight or flight response. So they become like a bit of a catch-22 story where they don't have enough copper, they can't make noradrenaline, so then they get more stressed and then, you know, the, the whole cycle and it just perpetuates. But, yeah, that can happen for sure. Do you find that they also um, are people that are always, they, like they have no energy, but they're always doing a bunch of stuff? Do you find that? Mm. that they're like, they seem like they would be sympathetic dominant people because there's do 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 sometimes they're go-getters but then they also really don't have energy it's almost like they're just running on empty yeah well they're usually running on adrenaline that they're overproducing or stimulants so you know they're running on exactly, ca yeah. caffeine sugar and chocolate <laughs> usually <laughs> uh, or, or all of those <laughs> So, um, yeah, and, you know, those people, particularly fast metabolizers, metabolizers are very prone to um, running on stress chemicals. So they will feel energized because they, you know, have taken on extra projects and they're busy and, you know, they probably are quite happy feeling busy. But all of that energy is actually coming from their adrenal glands working over time and overproducing their stress hormones. <laughs> of course yeah I, 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 to me it's very common i see people do that all the time whether or not they're big business execs or um just a local person at your you know like at the cafe they're all seem to be running on empty but they're like using up this these uh stress hormones rather than having true energy and oftentimes they don't even realize how fatigued they are mm. right? yeah and yeah. Do you think that would be a reason for like anxiety or something? Maybe they don't have enough energy to interact with people or talk with people. Well, yeah, look, I think it's an interesting one because, um, you know, my, my husband and my clinic partner is a hypnotherapist and a psychotherapist. So we do share a lot of um, clients and people come to him for primarily anxiety related issues. Yeah. And it's really interesting when he brings this up with um, these clients, is they'll usually say, um you know oh i'm you know i have to be busy and you know i have to have things scheduled and you know there's so much i have to do and it's like their their busyness is sort of their um badge of honor you know it's, that's how they feel like they're achieving things because they're so busy and when he gets them to actually you know go into hypnosis relax in the chair they will usually come out and say oh i had no idea how stressed and tired i was until I relaxed in your session. <laughs> and they yeah. always say, you know, oh, wow, I've never been this relaxed in, you know, as far as I can remember. And then, you know, that same person will come and see me and we'll do a hair analysis and what a surprise, you know, their, like, adrenals are shot. So they're either super fast metabolizer with short adrenals or they're a <laughs> slow metabolizer with really depleted adrenals. And, you know, of course, they've been running in these busy, busy pattern for a long time. But what a lot of people use that for is to avoid dealing with uncomfortable feelings or trauma or other stuff yeah. that they've experienced. So, you know, and I can fully rely, I used to do this for years, you know, until yeah. <laughs> I learned about all this. It's like, you know, the more projects you have, the less time you have to think about difficult things and to address difficult things. So, you're yeah. going to, it's like your brain is going to burn out your body. It's, you know, the brain wants more and more and more and achieves more and more and more. <laughs> and the poor body is just like dragging behind and going, stop, I need to rest. Rest That's your it. it reminds yeah. me of, I don't know if you've read the book um, by James Joyce. Um, I, forget, I forget the title of it, but it, it's about Mr. McDuffie. And he says, Mr. McDuffie lives quite a ways quite a ways away from his body and it was this idea that he lived in his head and not connecting with his actual body exactly. and, and that sounds like what you're talking about when their mind is like go 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 and their body just can't keep up it's like yeah yes <laughs> yeah and look at some stage and some people will realize that at some stage and start you know going oh i have digestive symptoms and i have hormonal symptoms and you know why is this happening um, it was, you know, a lot of people don't, um, a lot of people will just keep going until they burn out and collapse, um, or, you know, acquire a more serious disease. Um, but yeah, they, they just not really paying attention to their physical symptoms. Yeah. <laughs> 
it's interesting too. <laughs> it is um and they say mind over matter so sometimes that people don't realize really what's going on and like you were saying like they kind of compensate by doing other stuff so they um have you heard of the, like the your issues are in your tissues kind of thing they, they talk about your yeah. emotional problems right well in hair testing it's almost the same right we, we find like issues in their tissue like but they're biochemical in nature right whether or not it's high copper low manganese high manganese whatever uh so it, it's a reflective to me still that there's an emotional component on a hair test that may not necessarily say you know you're a trauma victim or whatever but you can see some imbalance there. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, I think that the issues in the tissues is um, a really good <laughs> analogy for what we see. Totally. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So I'm curious, have you had, because uh, you work with your husband, have you had someone that does a hair test and then didn't do any supplement approach at all and then did got another hair test? Have you had that experience before? want to share <laughs> sorry can you just repeat that question john i just had a you hearing you yeah so um if you've had someone that uh worked with say your husband that got a hair test before and then didn't do any supplements right mm -hmm. and then maybe got another hair test have you gone through something like that before and just seen if there was any major changes once they started to implement relaxation therapies rather than um no i haven't done it that way to you know evaluate it empirically like yeah, that just curious I, it's a genuine yeah question. that would be an interesting experiment yeah. yeah no look i think you know they do definitely benefit from um the mental health therapies a hundred percent so from the point of view of um you know reducing stress and addressing anxiety issues and uh you know just getting people to slow down like there's lots of benefits that people can get from hypnosis or you know psychotherapy lots of emotional based therapies a hundred percent they do much better when they also do the nutritional therapy because you know just having those fundamental nutrients that allow the brain to work properly um are really beneficial so you know if someone's handling of stress is going to be much better if their magnesium and zinc are replete um, I, you know, yeah, the, way, I agree. the way they handle any conflict you know any situation um if they've had their copper imbalances addressed are they not going to be angry and reactive to their partner in therapy for example you know there's so many <laughs> you know all the minerals like you know you and i know have those personality characteristics like they actually will change someone's behavior and the way that they think based on the mineral imbalances that someone has so um yeah it's just it's going to be um much more valuable you know the value that they get from psychological therapy is going to be far greater i, I agree i was just curious if you you know um, yeah it's a be good experiment yeah because <laughs> i've had some clients maybe you have um that are very resistant like like doesn't matter seems what you do to try and change their mineral levels on a hair test and it just it seems like they're not even taking any like it just nothing happens and then they overcome some dramatic emotional issue that was going on in their immediate you know environment and then everything clicks into place it's like they have the energy to do something about it they can you know whatever the problem was um they sort it out and then mm -hmm. the next hair test, it's like huge changes, you know, that, that have occurred. And, and we were like waiting, <laughs> trying to do things, you know, with just nutrition. It was like they, they were, there was an emotional component there that was blocking the healing. A hundred percent. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think a lot of the time we see that probably on the, you know, the calcium shell I'm sure you've looked into a lot of that research on, yeah. uh, you know, when someone has this extremely high level of calcium on their hair and, you know, certain other um, levels where they actually are emotionally blocking themselves. So it's like the body's retained all this calcium 
to actually block um, the emotional impact of something that's happened. Yeah. And I do see a lot of that um, in people who've had trauma. So, I, you know, guaranteed if I'm going through someone's intake in their first appointment and they had, you know, childhood trauma or abuse or something quite major happened to them, guaranteed on their hair, I will see a calcium shell. So is that an indicator for you that everyone's a little different with this? So is that an indicator for you that there could be a copper problem when they have yep. that high calcium? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It usually will go to that, you know, so whether you see that copper on the first hair analysis or not necessarily always, but yeah, it, it's going to be there for sure. And that creates that whole emotional profile where, you know, someone's quite detached with their, from their emotions they're not dealing with them. They're just, you know, burying themselves in work or food or, you know, looking after somebody. And, um, yeah, a, a lot of the time those people are female. Again, that's a generalisation. But I do find, yeah, it's females and they tend to be the ones who are very um, overcommitted. You know, so they're either caring for someone like elderly family or children and it's all about give, give, give to everyone else, nothing for yourself. And, you know, what a surprise, they end up with a lot of um, health problems. Yeah. And to some degree, that calcium can help them continue to help people and continue to do these things. But at the end of the day, it's not really helpful to the person themselves, right? And I think yeah. that's a challenge they always have. People that are too giving are left with nothing left, right, for themselves. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, they end up really depleted. And, you know, I think, you know, that calcium ends up sitting in the wrong places. Like it's not meant to be sitting in their joints or breast tissue or their thyroid. It's all yeah. that calcium that's not sitting in the bone, which is creating those problems. And, you know, my theory is also, and this is just a theory, yeah. that um, I think what happens with a lot of emotional issues where people see um you know, psychiatrists and um, psychologists and hypnotherapists and all sorts of therapists is um, that they actually have calcium deposits in between the two hemispheres of their brain. And that's why, you know, there's so much difficulty with um, trauma processing and PTSD and things like that because the two hemispheres are not communicating. So they get stuck in that very logical left brain, you know, everything is very like, unemotional and cold and um logical and there's <laughs> not communication, you know between the yeah. right hand which is all about creative and artistic and emotional yeah. so that bit of a theory of mine yeah i'm sure someone will um, do some brain scans at some stage and have a look <laughs> but yeah calcified um space between two hemispheres i think it's a definitely a possibility you know and i know um just from experience of like, you know, Dr. Joe Dispenza's work and some of the Bruce Lipton stuff. And they talk about stepping into that realm of possibility. And then, um, and then the way I think it relates to what you're saying is like, they have to access that creative side that can mm -hmm. sometimes find a different neural network around the calcium that just say, if you were right, has to find some way around it rather than just the direct, you know, shortest <laughs> method yeah. to get there. And maybe that's one reason why it can be beneficial and then it mm. might open something up, right? A new pathway. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think another part to that is, you know, their pineal gland gets calcified. It's very easy, you know, for that little gland to absorb too much calcium when we have um, excessive calcium in the wrong places in the body. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, people like Joe Dispenza believe that, you know, it's the pineal gland, the third eye that allows us to have that imagination and think about manifesting things and, you know, all of those things that allow people to meditate easily. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it will have an impact on lots of different areas. I love it. And I, I think, um, you know, like having that access to the frontal lobe, the brain, the pituitary gland, all that um, would give you access to think forward in, in advance on how you'd like to do something differently in your life. But usually when you're in a state of trauma, you're not trying to do things differently. You're more so just reacting as the day goes on. You don't really think about going ahead and possibilities of changing it. It's just, that's what I deserve or whatever, right? And they get stuck in this mentality. Um, Absolutely. 
So do you think um, when somebody has that high calcium and then, uh, you know, a copper problem that their thyroid would be diminished and that could be also be contributing to some of the, you know, uh, mental states they'd be going through? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So a really common pattern that we'll see on hair analysis is that high calcium, low potassium, high copper. So calcium to potassium is considered to be like our thyroid indicator yep. ratio. So yeah, when someone is in that state, they're going to have, everything's going to be running slowly. So, you know, calcium is really sedative. And it, it probably also calcifies someone's thyroid when it's um, sitting in the wrong places. So, um, yeah, they're going to be tired, depressed, slow bowels, fatigued, you know, everything's kind of down and slow and they're not going to be very motivated to do things as well. So, yeah, weight gain is usually an issue. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I find that too. And, I mean, to me, it's really hard to say it's just copper, you know what I mean? Because copper can cause problems, but, you know, in the older days, they used to say if you had a low thyroid, depression was one of the number one indications. And then, you know, doctors of the old would then put them on thyroid support, right? Whether or not it was medication or, you know, thyroid gland or something, they would give that to support the person when they were depressed. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, it's this whole thing where they go, oh, it's just neurotransmitters and you need to do something else. So, you know, <laughs> and one way or another, you need copper to do neurotransmitters, like you've said. Mm -hmm. yeah, dopamine is dependent on copper. Um, so do you think it's really hard to ultimately say what symptoms copper actually presents? Or do you think that it's more um, easy, like Carl Pfeiffer said, and it was bipolar, apathy, schizophrenia, that kind of thing? Um, yeah, look, I find it really fascinating and I do a lot of um, in-depth questionnaires um, with people who present with mental health issues and spend a lot of time talking to them about exactly what sort of thoughts they're having because I think, you know, not enough time gets spent by people assessing that and it's very different. You know, someone might say, oh, I feel depressed. That can mean something completely different to another person. Yeah. And I think it's, yeah, it's really important to get them to actually describe what are the sort of thoughts that they're having. So if it's, you know, oh, I'm just feeling tired and I can't get motivated today and I feel a bit down, that's a really different statement to I feel like nothing ever good is going to happen to me and I want to die. You know, those, those yeah. two, it's a really different, you know, the first one is about I'm low in dopamine and I have no motivation to get my day started. That's really what it's about. Whereas the second one is I have no serotonin, so everything's going to look really black. <laughs> you know? um, so, yeah, you can even tell the way that someone speaks and the same with anxiety, you know, it's, it's whether it's free floating generally about everything. You know, people just feel anxious about anything that happens in their day, which, you know, a lot of the time can be a histamine problem. Mm -hmm. um, or whether they're anxious about something really specific. You know, it's, it's so varied. And I think, yeah, if you can do a really detailed questionnaire, qualitative questionnaire on their thoughts, um, that can tell us a lot of things about what they're actually presenting with. But, yeah, it's not all about a single mineral because they have so many far-reaching effects. You know, but I find, you know, just being really general, copper tends to be, um, I describe it to people as irritable, cranky, angry, um, easily frustrated, you know, go from zero to 100, react. Um, that's copper, you know, that's a really general characteristic of copper. And in a child, it would be aggression um, or severe anxiety. But most of the time, it seems to be about aggression or misbehavior or, you know, being really oppositional. Um, yeah. Kids who are really difficult to deal with. So, not so much defensive, but more offensive. Like they're always on edge and they're ready to come yeah. forward in the kid, maybe. Yeah. So, is in the, in the adults, is it the opposite? They're more defensive? Or I think that kind of depends on whether they're an introvert or an extrovert. So okay. I find like copper and introvert tends to be more inward focused and becomes anxiety. Okay. And copper and an extrovert is like, it's everyone else's fault. And I'm just going to dump <laughs> it. 
you know, okay. that's what I used to be, you know, a copper toxic extrovert. So it was, I just was angry at everyone <laughs> and it would be like, it's all your fault, you know, and just throwing it out, out, out at people. Yeah. Um, so it depends. Yeah. So most people think, uh, and maybe you agree or not, and you feel free to share, but most people think um, when you have someone with copper excess, um, that it's usually because of adrenal insufficiency or their adrenal gland isn't functioning properly. Um, that's what some people think. But when you were, when you were telling me about that copper thing, the frustrated, the anger and all that, I immediately thought the Chinese medicine liver, liver gallbladder. So do you yeah. think there's a liver gallbladder connection with these? I think there's everything. I think there is usually adrenal insufficiency, liver gallbladder problems, but I think, you know, we can't underestimate the toxicity. So if someone is on a copper IUD and they literally have these copper, you know, drip, drip, dripping into their bloodstream a whole yeah. entire day, it doesn't really matter if their adrenals or um, liver gallbladder are underfunctioning. They're just going to be really toxic. So That's a good um, point, yeah. Yeah, it's. I think it's. Yeah, it's like that triangle relationship where there's exposure and the level of exposure, and then yeah, how are the organs dealing with it? Um, yeah, certainly doesn't help if you've got a liver gallbladder under function. Um, you know, in terms of eliminating copper, but it's like you know, if the tap is turned on and it's pouring in all this copper, you know, how the the plug is working, it, it's yeah, it's going to have an effect, but ultimately you end up with a whole pile of copper. <laughs> So, yeah, no, if, you know, if someone's been ill, yeah, it's, yeah, it's the exposure can be enormous in people that I see. So, yeah, all of those have to be addressed. <laughs> so do you think um, that that's a really good point? So do you think obviously copper ID, IUD is going to be a, a major um, exposure for excess copper? Um, what do you think about hormonal IUDs? Do you think it's the same kind of thing? Definitely, yeah. I, I find it slower, you know. So if someone's on a hormonal IUD or just the oral contraceptive pill, it's more of a like a long term zinc depletion mm -hmm. that happens. Um, so yeah, they are pro copper indirectly, but I actually find the worst exposure is through um, pipes. It's the old pipes that are just leaching copper, and it's probably just a function of I guess where I am. So the area of Sydney that I practice in has a lot of very old houses um from you know like the 1800s and the early 1900s and the 1960s so the amount of copper pipes around here is quite ridiculous and you know because I had that experience myself where you know I've always lived in a house that had an excellent reverse osmosis filter and then I was in a rental property just for a few months and you know I decided I'm not going to worry about the filter because you know it's only a short time and, you know, I just used the fridge filter, which doesn't really do anything. So, basically, I was drinking, you know, iced tap water. Yeah. And, you know, it was incredible. Within two months, I started getting ridiculous copper excess symptoms, like, you know, hormonal acne that I've never had before in my life, um, anxiety and, you know, worse mood fluctuations, worse periods. Um, it was incredible, you know, within a really, really short period of time. And then as soon as I... I realized, moved out of there, got a filter, started detoxing again, all of that went away. So, yeah, I think, you know, especially for people who are very predisposed to zinc deficiency, um, you know, people with pyroluria or they just have chronic zinc deficiency, yeah. um, that exposure can just be enormous. Fantastic. Um, that, that's so honestly i'm sorry you went through that but it's a great learning experience nonetheless you you learned a short period even though it wasn't copper iud or something that was you know hormonally related entirely um you were still exposing yourself to copper and then it was causing you an issue so yeah um, yeah, and very interestingly, you know what um, people normally say is oh, i've tested my water and it's fine yeah and yeah. you know, and I did test the water, and it was fine. It was fine according to the government uh, benchmarks, but if the government benchmarks for metals in the water are not necessarily optimal health benchmarks. <laughs> so you know, yeah. even though like the water wasn't toxic, it was within the government guidelines, but it was still too high for you know physiological effect. 
So, and, and it's really interesting. And then I tested um, the same water from a tap that's had the reverse osmosis filtration. And, you know, that level was 0.005 of copper, whereas the tap water was 0.5, which is, you know, a huge difference. But that 0.5 was still within the government guidelines. Yeah. So it's very difficult, you know, to convince um people when them that they actually do have a, a problem with their water um because it's still too much yeah no it, it's quite mm. interesting um i know when i first moved to the property that we're on now the first thing i did was went down and looked at the pipes to see what they were um and fortunately it was a new build but be just because it's a new build doesn't mean that they you know use the pvc pipe or some other kind right so mm. i was i was still concerned um, so do you, have you found any issue with like PVC pipe? There's always going to be a, a problem. I know like it's inevitable. It's plumbing, right? Yeah. But, uh, do you find it to be better to have that plastic um, pipes rather than the copper? Yeah, I think look, it's safer generally because at least you're not getting metal, um, you know, lead as well. It's not, at least you're not getting copper and lead into your water. Yeah. Um, you have a really good filter that is going to remove all those plastic particles whatever is there then it's probably enough it's probably as good as it gets really so yeah it's not a perfect <laughs> <laughs> i thought the same thing i'm like look it's better than copper but mm. what to what extent is this like you're always going to have problems you're not going to have glass pipes going through your house right probably some other problem if you do that right <laughs> yeah so um some people usually say look you don't have to worry about copper you just take zinc mm -hmm. do you think that's <laughs> like a valid thing to say oh, i'll take a high dose zinc and now i don't have to worry no because it's also like what we were saying before about you know the liver and gallbladder's ability to actually eliminate it and you know copper gets stored in the body we know that it gets stored in the liver it gets stored in the brain so it's not as easy as you know you just drank some water with copper in it and then all this stuff worked magically and it's out the next day you know that the body doesn't really do that um so there's always going to be some storage of it building up and it really then you're taking the risk of do I have enough to roll a plasma and the copper binding protein in my body to be binding all this copper and making it safe so that it's not running around the bloodstream causing all sorts of damage. And, you know, not many people will investigate all these things. So, um, no, it's not enough to just take zinc because copper still <laughs> needs to be eliminated properly and, um, you know, prevented from doing damage. So you think that you should come at it with other nutritional factors as well, or do you use herbs? What, what kind of way would you look at? Just hypothetic. I know I understand everyone's different, but as a general, you know, thought, if you have someone with high copper, zinc would still be in, in part of your protocol. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm definitely one of those practitioners who uses zinc um, a lot straight away. You know, I don't, I mean, sorry, not a lot straight away. I start people slow <laughs> yeah. and then I build them up to quite a lot. So I am a fan of high dose zinc, um, okay. you know, as part of a nutritional program for, you know, with all the other nutrients um, because I've found that personally, uh, you know, I need 200 milligrams of zinc per day yeah. and that's how much I take all the time. Right. And that's how much I need to function, right? So everyone's need for nutrients is extremely varied. And, you know, if you have predisposing genetics, like, you know, you have metallothionine issues or if you have pyroluria or other things, you know, your ability to actually retain zinc in the body is really um, suboptimal. So that's something that will be needed quite a lot. Um, other nutrients, definitely, you know, manganese, molybdenum, vitamin C, they're all really important to keep the copper in check. Um, but also, you know, making sure that their ceruloplasmin level is at a good level. Yeah. That's really important. So that's, you know, your fat-soluble nutrients, vitamin A, vitamin D, um, are really important for that as well, and liver function. So, you know, we need to make sure that the liver is making a good amount of ceruloplasmin plasma to get that copper safely into its little taxi and out where it needs to go of course um thanks for sharing so i'm fascinated you said 200 milligrams of zinc and 
Um, for some people that don't know, just because you take 200 milligrams of zinc, it doesn't mean you're taking 200 milligrams of elemental zinc. It's 200 milligrams of zinc bound, like while it's bound to an amino acid, right? Yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> yeah. yes. it would be taking a lot. Um, I, I'm similar. I use a lot of zinc in my practice. And sometimes I get people, um, even other practitioners that get upset. They go, you're going to cause this some problem by giving, you know, more than 50 milligrams of zinc, or, uh, you know. I'll never do that. Uh, mm. <laughs> at least twenty-five, but I mean, mm. honestly, I use minimum for at least not everybody, but usually about seventy-five to hundred milligrams. Yeah, that that's where I want to get them to before really I consider therapy has started. Absolutely, right? yeah, it's, and agree, yeah. <laughs> so, do you find yes. people really suffer when you give zinc, and and especially low dose in the beginning? Have you found that they get fatigue or any issues when they first start? Usually not. No, usually, look, I, I find that if they have a good amount of magnesium and vitamin C also in their protocol and some molybdenum, that, you know, things will be much more balanced and um, even. And, you know, we do a lot of work with optimizing adrenals and liver and, you know, all those processes so that it can all be metabolized correctly and dealt with correctly. Um, but no, I find that, you know, people do feel different, you know, and I warn them that they're going to feel different um, <laughs> on a nutritional program. But, you know, yeah. I've never had any horrible, you know, copper dumping side effects or you know someone being completely um wiped out from it or anything like that um i think it's important to have adequate zinc and find the right form of zinc for the right person and make sure that they're absorbing it um you know i took zinc for colonate probably for two or three years and none of my bloods or hair zinc moved anywhere Mm -hmm. And it took me a long time. Like that was pretty stupid, you know, given the amount of time that it took Two years, <laughs> yeah. to figure out that it just wasn't the right form. Um, you know, so, yeah, you have to find the, the right type and the right dose for the person. But, yeah, I'm definitely a big fan of a good amount of zinc, yeah. So you don't like zinc to colonate, which is... No. <laughs> okay. So I'm curious. Never out there yeah look i know it's really popular especially with integrative doctors um and you know william walsh uses it a lot and he likes it um yeah look i think some people do well on it i find a lot of people don't and a lot of people just can't break that the colonate away from the zinc molecule because they have low hydrochloric acid and it's just you know it's just the wrong form and if they take a citrate or a glycinate they just start getting much better results much quicker so, yeah, it's a bit of a trial and error, but, um, yeah, I, I don't really use it in clinic anymore. Can I ask you a question? Because, I, I mean, I don't really use zinc picolinate, mostly because we use something called zinc um, rice protein chelate, which is basically zinc bound to a full spectrum of amino acids rather than just glycinate or just citrate or something. So it's got all the kinds in oh. there. Um, and mm -hmm. you probably have seen that in the shops, magnesium, amino acid, chelate. That's all it says. It doesn't tell you what it is. You can get zinc like that as well. Um, but I'm curious when it comes to like, like, have you played around with some of those more exotic um, liposomal magnesium or liposomal zinc, the ones that are taken orally? Have you used those? Um, not the zinc and the magnesium. No, I've done liposomal vitamin C and, you know, okay. glutathione and things like that. Um, no, I haven't as yet. Um, I do a lot of transdermal zinc um, delivery. Okay. So, yeah, getting compounded with a compound chemist. Okay. And, um, you know, yeah, and usually it's a zinc and B6 formula, like a pyrrole type formula. And um, I find that that's exceptional because it bypasses the gut altogether. And, okay. you know, you put something on the skin, it's pretty much in the bloodstream within a few minutes. And I find I started using that with children and now I actually use it with adults as well, um, not just because it's easy to administer, but also it's just really effective and um, how quickly you can get into the bloodstream. Honestly, I've never even considered zinc to go. I mean, I, ha I mm. don't get me wrong. I, I do know you put something on the skin especially if it's oil soluble or, or in a, like a fat of some kind, the skin will pull it in. But yeah. I've just never really considered that. So, yeah, <laughs> so thank yeah, you for that. Yeah. Super effective. Yeah. It's, I mean, it has to be 
made properly by a compounding pharmacy. So it's not like something I'd buy online. You know, there are people selling stuff online, but yeah, I yeah. wouldn't buy that. Yeah, it has to be properly made with the right exactly fat soluble um, particles. But um, yeah, and you can vary the dose as well. It's really easy to adjust the dose, you know, because it's just cream that you apply. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that has to be prescribed, of course. You need to see your practitioner who can then order it um, from a compounding pharmacy. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's definitely a more expensive option, but um, highly effective. And especially people who have severe gut problems, you know, where they have celiac or they've had some severe, you know, dysbiosis and bacterial dysfunction and they're not absorbing things through their gut very well at all. Um, that's another way to go. Yeah, just like you would use a magnesium oil, you know, on yeah. the skin lotion, very similar. Cool. I love it. I kind of want to try it myself. <laughs> just yeah. to play around because cool. really I've never cool. actually considered that. That's, that's yeah, fantastic. It's, yeah, when you have B6 in it, it's bright orange. So just be careful with um, any white shirts that <laughs> you might yeah. want to wear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you always, it's always the same case, right? Like especially magnesium. Make sure you're not wearing any jewelry. Um, yeah. You know, I've destroyed, not that I wear a lot of jewelry, but every time I seem to put on, a jeweler <laughs> i was like oh magnesium and i put it on and i just destroyed yeah. it so just yeah be mindful of that um yeah hey, look that's awesome you shared so much wonderful information today maria um uh, about a bunch of different things we, i know we were going to initially talk about just minerals and mental health but look it, it's all integrated we're, we're a connected human right so it all comes back to physical and mental health ultimately so I'm curious if you could share, um, <laughs> just maybe you could summarize what we've talked about today, maybe just a couple of points, you know, for um, people that don't have time to listen to the podcast, but, you know, it's like a little sound bite. Sure, sure. Um, I guess uh, the number one thing would be, do a hair analysis. Find a practitioner who <laughs> does hair analysis and, um, you know, do one because the things that you can uncover um, from a very simple test are pretty incredible. And, you know, every time I go through the results with somebody, um, they're blown away by how much insight has been achieved from this simple test into their health. Um, and uh, work with a practitioner to really optimize your super important minerals. So, you know, your calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, copper, and zinc. Um, super, super important to get them right in balance um, because they govern so much of our health. So, metabolic health, mental health, immune function, thyroid function, adrenals, um, you know, everything doesn't work when the minerals are out of balance. It's as simple as that. And from a mental health perspective, I think um, understanding how your brain works and the sort of thoughts that you're having is super, super important to help your practitioner identify what's actually not right with your neurotransmitters and your minerals. Yeah, that's probably it in a nutshell, I would say. That's a fantastic last point because... Maybe you've experienced, I've experienced it. It's almost like they have their cards and they're playing cards and they don't want to show you their deck, right? Mm. And it, you're yeah. kind of trying to tease it out of them sometimes and you don't want to put words in their mouth, but if they won't share it with you, it's hard to help them because you don't, yes. they could be holding back a little piece of information that can be very helpful. Um, and it could be the missing piece, right? The missing link so yes. that everything comes together. So fantastic. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And when your practitioner has a 20 page intake questionnaire, um, yeah, definitely fill it all out in a lot of detail <laughs> because, you know, it's there yeah. for a reason. That's exactly why we do these things, you know, to yeah, really get into the details of someone's health history. Yeah. We get, I, when I, people sometimes, not everyone, I have some great clients, some just skip through and say, I have none of these things. And then you talk to them and it's a complete different and they story. Them out. <laughs> and you're thinking, look, you could have saved time if you just told, filled it out, really. Yeah. <laughs> they try to save time, but it takes longer. So, you know, um, yeah, thanks for sharing, you know, those tips. Uh, one last thing, right? You, 
yourself, you teach practitioners about hair testing, right? Like natural mm-hmm. paths and other practitioners. Do you want to just share a little bit of that with us? Where sure. They can find yeah. yeah. So I have a Facebook um, practitioner group where, you know, all types of health practitioners, um, naturopaths, nutritionists, herbalists, um, acupuncturists, chiropractors, um, uh, psychologists, all types of um, complementary health practitioners can join. So that one's called Hair Analysis for Health Practitioners. That's easy to find. And I have an online training course for practitioners on hair analysis, uh, which can be found either in the group or on my website, which is um, truefoodsnutrition.com.au forward slash education. Um, So, yeah, you can have a look there. I also do a lot of mentoring for practitioners on hair analysis. So, you know, if you've got a few tricky cases um we go through them and you know look at treatment protocols and all of that um but yeah i'm pretty passionate about it and i think it can just make such an amazing difference to someone's health and i've seen it so many times in clinic um where you know it it can literally the right nutritional program based just on a hair analysis can really turn things around so yeah it's a very underestimated tool um in nutritional therapy i think to be honest i think it's one of the most cost effective ones and i mean look the dutch test can be very good as well right yes. or organic acid but the new dutch test adds some organic acids to it so they're getting cheeky but yes. um <laughs> but those panels can be helpful uh, but hair testing is the most cost effective one i've found so yes um yeah, I like to think of it as a starting point. You know, I always do a hair analysis first and then that usually opens up avenues for investigating everything else. So, you know, sometimes we need some bloods to have a look at a few extra aspects. Sometimes we need a hormonal test like a Dutch test. Sometimes we'll need a gut analysis to see what's going on. And, you know, I usually will do all those tests as well if necessary. But, yeah, hair analysis is definitely just a great starting platform for anyone. All right. Thanks for sharing, Maria. Um, it was a real pleasure speaking with you. And hopefully in the future, we can reconnect and maybe chat again. Absolutely. Yeah, likewise. Thanks, John. That was fun. <laughs>